Good morning, CPC. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of the new year, 2021. Let's kiss 2020 goodbye, shall we? And start anew on this day. This is also Communion Sunday, and maybe, hopefully, it will be the last time that we'll have communion virtually before we start to meet again in person. I hope that is the case. We will wait and see. So let's begin with a prayer before we read our scripture this morning. Please pray with me. Show us something old, but new today, O oh God. Something time-honored, yet innovative and fresh. Teach us what you would have us to know so that we can stand for freedom, advocate for your justice, adhere to your discipline, and persevere in your way. We want to learn, dear Lord. We want to grow and mature. Help us to do so in your love, in your grace, in your embrace. For we ask it in the name of him who has gone before us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and teacher. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Jeremiah, a familiar and popular verse that you well know probably, Jeremiah chapter 31, and we'll be reading verses 31 through 34. Listen for a word from the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. Now, you probably know by now that in the spring or early summer of each year, I put together a schedule of sermons when, and it goes well into the future, sometimes a year or more into the future, it stretches. This enables me to anticipate and prepare for what is coming. For instance, if I know that a sermon is coming up on the topic of reconciliation, then in my reading and studying, I can be looking out for articles or webinars on reconciliation. I can be gleaning the fields of literature for examples and illustrations of the concept. And of course, I can always alter the sermon topic when world events dictate. When 9-11 occurred, for instance, it will be the 20th anniversary of that tragic event this September, by the way. I'll never forget that the beginning of my sermon that next Sunday started with the words, terrorists have taken over my pulpit. Words that I never had expected to say from the pulpit when I put my sermon schedule together months before. I share that with you because nine months ago, when I decided on a title for this sermon for this Sunday, the first year, the first day, the first Sunday of 2021, entitled it A New Day, I had no idea what 2020 would end up looking like or how it would end with a vaccine rolling out to combat a virus that would already have taken nearly 350,000 lives in our country alone. I had no idea. So, needless to say, this is one of those key times when I'm leaving the sermon title the way that I found it. Yet, it doesn't mean that what I had planned to say isn't relevant or prescient. Not by a long shot. You see, in Jeremiah's day, the people of God had been exiled to a foreign land, Babylon. And they were suffering there. Jeremiah was suffering along with them. You see, he did not do his prophesying from a distance. No, Jeremiah had been exiled to Babylon too, far away from his home and all the comforts of his native land. The familiar places where the people of God had worshipped and served and been taught were now gone. They were going to have to find a new way to learn a new way to exist. I don't envy a prophet who is called upon to deliver that message to his people. But when you think about it, we today are in a similar boat to the people back then. Indeed, for many persons today, the effects of the pandemic have certainly felt like an exile, exiled away from our familiar traditions and activities, exiled away from people we love, exiled away from patterns we were used to and from everyday comforts that we had taken for granted for so long. 
Yes, many today feel like they have been in a foreign land. No, it may not be Babylon as it was back then, but it is a place where people have suffered and struggled and even died. We therefore need to find somehow a new way of living now at this point. Merely going back to the old is not going to cut it today. That world is gone. So much has happened since then, since the beginning of the pandemic. We thus need to find a new way of going forward, a creative way that takes into account all that we've learned and experienced during this pandemic. And that is not as easy as it sounds. For our tendency as human beings is to want to simply pick up exactly where we left off. But that's impossible. Instead, we need to find an imaginative continuation. You know, on the heels of the Great Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt instituted what came to be called the New Deal, a series of economic initiatives and social programs intended to respond to the devastating events that had clobbered our nation at that time. Wildly popular now, nearly a hundred years later, those programs that FDR proposed were maligned by politicians and people at the time as experiments in socialism. That's right. And were roundly criticized as ushering in the end of capitalism and life as we know it in these United States. Roosevelt barely escaped with his political life and his political capital had been severely diminished. Yet today, social security, consumer protections, and what has since come to be known as Medicare are indispensable parts of the social safety net as we know it, and on which all Americans rely. Try to get rid of them now, or even to privatize portions of them, and you will widely be considered an immoral act and it would be political suicide. But when they were brand new, they came under intense fire. Jeremiah experienced something similar in his day. Oh, we read in chapter 31 of Jeremiah's prophecy now, especially since it's part of the holy canon of scripture, we read chapter 31 now and we think this is beautiful, poetic stuff. God putting his law into people's hearts. God making a new covenant with the people. Everyone knowing the Lord inwardly and intimately. Why, it's revolutionary. It's inspired. Who could argue with it? Answer? Nearly everybody. Just put yourself in their shoes. Those exiles to Babylon had been away from everything familiar for such a long, long time. All they really wanted now was to be taught in exactly the way that they had been taught before. Namely, by a rabbi. In the synagogue. With the same customs and instructions that they'd always received. That's what they wanted. What was all this stuff that Jeremiah was now saying about God writing the law on their hearts and about them no longer teaching one another and no longer saying, know the Lord to one another? They didn't want that. As beautiful as it sounds today, they wanted to have nothing to do with it. They did not desire this creative progressivism, if you will, this forced innovation. All the people back then wanted was for things to go back to the way they had always been done before. Before the exile, before the trials, before the suffering. They didn't want this new deal, even if it was clearly God who was calling them to it. And my friends, we may not be so different than they. Indeed, we may be tempted to see the nine months of COVID as a blip in time, as a speed bump in history, and that now everything can simply go back completely to the way it was before, 
now that we've got this vaccine. But my sisters and brothers in Christ, we can no more go back to where we were before COVID than we can go back to where we were before 9-11 happened. It's a marker and a signal that we need to change. The way we deliver health care needs to change. We've seen that. The racial disparities that were laid bare by the pandemic need to change. As do the economic inequalities that exist in our culture today. Change must happen. And that is not easy because the last nine months, we suppose, have not prepared us to change. On the contrary, all that has occurred has entailed so much change already. We can't be ready for more, can we? Mask wearing, physical distancing, virtual meetings, Zoom after Zoom after Zoom meeting. Surely God does not desire us to change any more now. But instead, to pull back and, and re-engage the old ways and traditions. Certainly God, of all people, would want us to retrench and remain mostly the same, right? But no, no, that has never been the message of the Bible. All through it, we are commanded to sing a new song, to follow a new commandment, to consider a new heaven and a new earth. The old is passed away, says the scripture, Behold, the new is coming. This is admittedly a hard sell to people who've been through so much, who have suffered mentally, physically, and emotionally through COVID, who just want to catch a break. Why the push to change, O oh God? The people in Jeremiah's time must also have wondered that. Why the hurry? Having lived on this planet all of our lives, we sometimes forget that the earth itself is moving. At the equator anyway, at 460 meters per second, or roughly 1,000 miles per hour. That's right, at all times. We may feel that we're going fast when we're going 100 miles per hour in an automobile, for instance, and I hope you won't go that speed, but we might feel we're going fast at that speed, but even that is only a tenth of the speed that our globe continually is spinning. And God being the creator of the universe, who are we to tell God that the earth is going too fast for us, that we need it to slow down, and that, God, you're simply asking us to change too much. If God is indeed turning the world around at such a speed, my friends, then we need to keep up. For the truth is, Jeremiah the prophet was urging the people of God to now continue to do what you have most recently learned in your exile. For the people had discovered that God's law didn't live in a book. In their exile, they didn't have all that. It didn't live in a book. It lived in their hearts. They'd learned that. That God's instruction was not limited to what a priest told them, or a pastor, or even a rabbi. But that there were things that God could teach them from within. That they didn't have to rely on someone else telling them to know the Lord in order for them to experience God, but that they could all know God from the least of them to the greatest. They'd learned those things during their exile. Did they jump at Jeremiah's advice to them therefore? Did they, did they completely embrace it? Not immediately. It took another 700 years before Jesus would appear on the scene with a fresh application of Jeremiah's message. I have not come to destroy the law, Jesus said, but to fulfill it. For I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come into him and will sup with him 
and he with me, or she with me. Yet even today, we are uncomfortable with Jesus challenging us to change. Less comfortable than we are with the comfort of things staying the same. In fact, it can be argued that Jesus was crucified because he challenged people to change their views about God and about persons created in the image of God. And like Jesus, Jeremiah was persecuted and misunderstood for his message. He voted for change. He spoke for change. He agitated for change. He surely set the stage for what would come after him. Jeremiah did all those things, but his own people didn't get it completely. They didn't get it. They turned on him. They maligned him, and they dismissed him. And in the end, they didn't get to where they needed to be because they only wanted to be where they had been. My siblings in Christ, let's change things in the world and in the church before it's too late. Let's take what we've learned during COVID, not just the things that we've learned that we don't like, but also the things we've discovered that work well, and let's apply them to our brand new situation. Let's do that. Let's not make the mistake of throwing out what has been innovative, and new in this experience we've had, as terrible and as difficult and as challenging as it has been. The new things that God has done in our midst. Let's not throw those things out in favor of what is now old and arguably stale. For my friends, tradition that is alive is that which is continually being developed the living legacy of those who have faithfully gone before us. By contrast, traditionalism is the already dead patterns that weigh us down, tie us up. We don't want traditionalism. We want tradition that's living. I will make a new covenant with my people, says the Lord. I will put my instruction within their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they admonish one another, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. Now, that's a new deal. That is a new arrangement. The call to it is as old as time, but it can be new to you and me if we are able to, to keep changing, if we are willing to keep growing. I think I can hear Jeremiah saying, amen to that. Can we say it too? Amen. Hallelujah. And Happy New Year. Great is your faithfulness, O God of Jacob. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of heaven's victory. 
And all your people sing along So remember your children Remember your people Remember your promise, oh God Your grace is enough Your grace is enough Your grace is enough for me Oh, your grace is enough Your grace is enough Your grace is enough for me So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, oh God Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Oh, your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Yeah. Your grace is enough. Oh, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. And on this first Sunday of the new year, I invite you to the Lord's table. As we always say, this is not the Presbyterian table. It's not limited to us. It's not the Lutheran, the Baptist, or the Methodist table. It's the Lord's table, and it's set out for you and me this morning. I invite you, if you're at home, to find your bread and grape juice or other drink for communion, and to be ready to participate as we go through the sacrament. As you know, on the night of our Lord's arrest, he took bread. After giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, we read that he took the cup and he poured it. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins for many. This do, as often as you do it, remembering me. This is the Lord's table. It is right to give God our thanks and our praise. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. I invite you now to take a piece of bread. This is bread of life for you today. And to dip it in the cup, this is the cup of the new covenant, the new relationship with God, and to partake. Join me in prayer. God, these are gifts from you. We cannot manufacture them. We cannot produce them. Your spirit somehow is amazingly present in these gifts, this bread and this cup, in these sacramental objects that we bring to this table today. Thank you for them. They change the way we see the world. They change how we feel about ourselves. So use them today, O oh God, in this new year, to change our perspective on the way we see things, on the way we look at people, knowing that you gave yourself for us so that we might in turn give ourselves for others, that your love and your grace might be known in the world. That is our reward, that you might be seen and known. So go with us from this place this morning. Imbue us with your spirit. Enable us to be your hands and your feet to a world in need. And God, bless this new year of 2021, we ask in Christ's name, amen.
I've shared this benediction with you before, but on the first Sunday of this new year, I thought it was appropriate to hear about what God will do that is new as we wait for the Lord. This from Revelation chapter 21. John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be God's people, and God will be with them. The Lord will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. My friends, go into the world in this new year, seeing God's newness all around you, seeing the challenges that you face as opportunities and not problems, knowing that God is busy creating new heavens and a new earth through you and me, through what we've learned, through what we've experienced, and through how we've grown. So go into the world today. Be a witness for God and God's grace and God's justice for all people. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you today and every day. Hallelujah. Amen.